Awesome. So yeah, th thank you very much to, to you for the very kind introduction as well as people who, who tuned in. So I think we can all agree that uh, deep learning has revolutionized the way that we measure uh, animal behavior in a non-invasive manner. But looking at those videos, I think it should be clear to, to everyone that estimating their poses as well as tracking the, those animals across time like is a real challenge. And so today, I'd like to illustrate what the challenges are and, um, and take you through the solution that we found using our toolbox, uh, Deep Lab Cut. So since we can't possibly um, solve that problem all at once, starting from the raw video to the, to the final output, we decided to break it down into uh, more tractable sub-problems. And so the way that we do this is our approach is, is bottom up. That is, we decided to build onto the strong deep lab cut detector for body parts. And then we build up to assemble those body parts together into animals. Then we need to track those animals across time. And once we obtain tracklets, then the, the final goal or the final sub problem is to stitch those tracklets together in order to form the final output. So our solution to the first sub problem, animal assembly, is iterative. That is, we will connect body parts together by going, um, by looping from bone to bone in, in, in the skeleton. And then we connect those body parts that obey um, certain roles and parameters. And, and three of those parameters are absolutely essential. So this is the, the three parameters you can see here, uh, path threshold, disnormalization, and detection threshold square. And those, like I said, they are uh, essentially, they are essential and they are uh, validated, say, by Bayesian optimization. Then we, we moved on to, to investigate the effect of using redundant skeletons on the accuracy or on the, the quality of the assembly. And what we realized is that using redundant skeletons, but what I mean by redundant is using a skeleton that has redundant connections between body parts, has a, has a great beneficial effect on not only on the number of unconnected body parts, that is we reduce by a factor of four, the number of body parts that are not connected, but we also uh, drastically improve the overall quality of the body parts that are correctly assigned the right animal. And once those animals are assembled, then we are left with the second sub problem, which is how we will propagate the identities of those animals across time. And the way we do this is we adapted a lightweight framework where for every given frame, we will try to match the detections. So the animals in the scene with predictions from trackers that are taken from the, from the preceding frame. So in other words, what we're trying to do here is to find a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between adjacent frames. And this is the process that we repeat every single frames in order to propagate identities forward. And what we, what we see is that, uh, especially using our uh, newest animal trackers, that tracking accuracy is near perfect, or uh, I'd say excellent, but we're still left with the problem of uh, fixing uh, identities, uh, switches or swaps, which very often occur when animals get occluded or uh, pass very close to one another. So what we do here is we recognize the need for a global solution to that final problem. So once we arrive at that final stage, you are left with a, a set of tracklets that you see here on the left of the screen. And the goal will be to find a, a, an optimal way to stitch them together such that they are kinematically consistent. And the efficient way that we, that we found to solve that problem, which is way different from the way we currently do it, is to cast the problem as a network flow optimization problem. So I won't get into the detail, but the idea here is if we can find flows through that graph such that the, the, the cost of that flow is minimum, then we immediately obtain uh, a, a globally optimal uh, track. And what, we, and what we see, for example, is that using that method, uh, we reduce by a factor 
um, by at least a factor of two up to a factor of seven, the number of identity switches. So just to just to wrap up, um, we know and, and we build, we, we know that pose estimation, whether it's single or multi-animal is very robust, which is why we decided to build onto this. But then in order to track multiple, anim uh, multiple animals, we, we need additional steps, which is to assemble those animals or detections into animals, then we track those animals through times. And we, in the final stage, we stitch those tracklets together. And I just like to, to remind people that the code is, um, is open, is open source on GitHub. It's still in beta, but the, the official version will be released quite soon. So like quite some nice additions. And, uh, and a big thank you to all my lab mates, uh, the PIs, the contributors and users of DeepLabCut. Um, DeepLabCut was originally published like two years ago and we've recently published a primer in year and that is, I believe, free access. So I'd encourage everyone that is curious to understand more about pause estimation to just go and have a look. And thanks to, to CZI for funding me. Thank you, Jesse. It is very, I mean, I'm also using the deep lab cut for pupil analysis. It is very useful and really easy. It, it has good documentation and everything. But yeah, one question while we are, please ask your questions in the question and answer panel for Jesse, deep lab cut uh, uh, software. I mean, one question I have for you is like currently it is in the Python. Is there any direction for using a MATLAB version of it or creating a MATLAB version of it? Well, that's a hard one because the, because the, the core of the package, right, is the, the whole machine learning architecture uh, relies very heavily on, Python, on packages that are written in Python. So to be, I don't know, that's a, that's a tricky question because I, I have no, no real idea about what it would take to actually uh, even build bindings to, uh, or, or bridge, let's say Python and MATLAB. But um, my, yeah, yeah my, my feel is that uh, obviously that's something I'd be considering, but I, I also feel that we've been spending a lot of energy into having, you know, notebooks that are pretty much um, ready to run where you just execute uh, pretty much every cell. And um, so, yeah, so I think that the, barrier anyway to, to use it was quite low but um matlab would be a would be a big piece a hard one yeah i, I think it, for many of in the academia year. yeah thank you we have a couple of questions for you first one is from edmund telly and he's uh edmund is asking saying that he's guessing tracking marmoset is more difficult than mice can you use animal specific physical markers to facilitate excellent question uh, there is something indeed that I do not mention during the during that short talk, which is um, that's something that we've been implementing quite recently. And actually, what it does is that then our network we also predict the identity of every single body part by precisely learning for some from some um, physical features of the of the animal. And in the in the mammoset case, for example, like. I don't think that was very clear from the video, but one of them had some uh, blue, uh, blue dye on one ear to make it, you know, slightly uh, recognizable from the from the other. And we could, for example, use that that feature uh, to to aid, I would say, in the process of um, recognizing uh, recognizing what uh, animal is uh, which animal is which one and also aid in the process of stitching the trajectories together. That would be an extra information to give to the, to the entire pipeline to, to facilitate or to make the more, to make the whole process more accurate. Thank you. We have another question for you from Joseph Lutzinger. Joseph says, great talk, Jesse. How does time of animal overlap change how hard it is to keep each animal correctly identified? Uh, thank you for the question. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the thing is, this is probably something that is hard for the, for the second sub problem that I mentioned. So 
if animals interact or get close to one another very often, then this is likely an issue for, for purely, purely tracking and pro uh, propagating identities on the, you know, frame by frame. But the good thing is we very recently understood that for the, for the last sub problem to, to solve, so stitching tracklets and doing it differently than we currently do, that is the, the way we currently do it is uh, we basically solve the problem very locally, and this is the way we stitch tracklets together. And so shifting from that, from that perspective and adopting an approach that is more global, we realized that um, we ended up with tracklets or, or tracks that were of much higher quality, so, such that this would correct precisely um, identity swaps, and this would work very well for even challenging data sets. So, Okay, thank you. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see, I can't see the question, so I, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I uh, that I answered to it fully. But and yeah, there is this question and answer panel down. If you click it, you will be able to see the questions as well on the screen next to the share screen button. And the, the other questions is from Christian Ebesan. A Christian says, it's very cool. It went a little fast. Could you perhaps show the slide with the accuracy in the mice after traplet stitching again? In an earlier slide, it looked like you had zero switch switches in the mice, but some switches with the traplet switching. All right, so I, so I guess this is the, the slide that um, that is being uh, referred to. So, so here indeed, um, oh, excuse me. Yeah, indeed, the, the multi-mouse data set is actually is very simple to, to solve. And using our three-stage, let's say, um, approach to the multi-animal problem, then we, we, we could just stop here and we would have amazing reconstruction. And I completely, sorry, and I completely here, I just discarded the multi-mouse uh, the multi uh, data set. So I'm only talking about the uh, the, um, the reduction in the number of switches that we observed on the, the two most challenging data sets that I, that I introduced. So, so naturally, since there was no uh, switches before with the multi-mouse and we, we end up with tracklets that were extremely long, there, there, is no, there is no way we would introduce switches by, by just stitching them together since they are essentially already, already stitched. Okay, thank you. And Joseph, the, for the previous questions, he says, that was great, but he has another question for you. He says, do you expect tracklets will improve etograms behavioral identification whenever that is implemented? Um, yeah, definitely, right. In the sense that if we, from the, from the tracking phase to, to obtaining the final tracks, if we end up with tracks that are very pure in, in the sense that they, they pretty much require no user input in order to correct for those swaps, then I guess this is very high quality data to, for any behavioral analysis or anything coming afterwards. Right? I think this is, those are just techniques to, to make users and, and also us developers more confident that whatever enters in a, processing pipeline is of very high quality. So I would definitely believe that uh, this is, yeah, this is extremely beneficial to whatever analysis is coming next. Okay, thank you. For Christian, for the previous questions, he says, you know, you mentioned 35 switches per what? Is it like in an hour or, you know? Okay, so this was switches. overall uh, across the entire video. So, so the fish actually, uh, I could even show it again, but uh, the fish video, um, yeah, the fish video had uh, 600 frames, but it's extremely challenging. So that is across all those interactions that you see here, and this is, I didn't count it, but that's probably 200 uh, possible crossing and, and risk of identity swaps. Then we, we took it down to only 35. And for the Mamoset case, I think this is 15,000 frames also where they are also uh, interacting together and hiding and, well, you know, passing close to one another. 
and we took it down to yeah from 200 or so um, identity swaps to to 30 something. So this is yeah that's um, an absolute number of of switches of identity switches. And thank you. I mean you have less than a minute, but I'm just going to read the last questions from Chen Vigo. For a new user to develop code, where should we start? Is there any platform for learning? So I think the best way would be uh, first to go to our GitHub repo, uh, because then we have amazing documentations. We have uh, great tutorials, access to, well, and I, and I see that uh, Mackenzie is kindly giving the link. Uh, so, well, anyway, we have a, a lot of resources, should it, whether it is videos uh, and uh, Jupyter notebooks to get started. And, and also if he, if he faces any issues to not to hesitate to, to meet us on that uh, forum, I guess, I think you have sent the link earlier where you should feel free to just ask questions and the whole community would, would be more than happy to answer. For me, I was using the GitHub, the tutorials folder you have. It, it is quite uh, useful to start with. Yeah, Matis just shared the deep lab code for you, which I'm going to share in the chat panel as well for you. And yeah, feel free to reach out. Okay, so we thank you very much, Jesse. This is really amazing. And now we are going to move.